The media remain heavily focused on President Trump's shot at the so-called judge and his ridiculous ruling blocking the temporary ban on refugees and citizens of seven countries, which a federal appellate panel has now upheld unanimously. What really sent the story into the stratosphere was Democratic Senator Richard Blumenthal reporting on his private meeting with Supreme Court nominee Neil Gorsuch. He certainly expressed to me that he is disheartened by the demoralizing and abhorrent comments made by President Trump about the judiciary. President responded by attacking Blumenthal and the coverage, first on Twitter and then with reporters. You misrepresented his comments totally. I asked you what your thoughts were, sir. Uh, his comments do is ask Senator Blumenthal about his Vietnam record that didn't exist after years of saying it did. The media war continues. Joining us now to analyze the coverage, Aaron McPike, White House correspondent for Independent Journal Review. Megan McCain, the co-host of Outnumbered on FNC. And Joe Trippi, Democratic strategist and Fox News contributor. Aaron, so the press reports that Neil Gorsuch told several senators he's disheartened and disillusioned about attacks on the judiciary. Trump says the media are mischaracterizing, misinterpreted his remarks. What's going on here? Well, what I thought found so interesting was that a day after those remarks came out, suddenly everybody said, well, well, maybe this actually helps Gorsuch because it shows that he's independent of Trump and he can appeal to some Democrats. But it took a day for that to come through. Now, that could have been really good spin for the White House. I don't know why they didn't get on board with that earlier. That was my initial reaction. But, Megan, are the media making too much of Richard Blumenthal's account of his private meeting with Gorsuch? And especially since the senator says that Gorsuch gave him permission to sort of go public with it. It wasn't just Richard Blumenthal. As Senator Ben Sass came out and echoed the sentiments that he said. I mean, I agree with Aaron that I wasn't sure if this was just a political spin trying to make Neil Gorsuch look like more of a person Democrats can confirm. Um, you know, this entire thing has turned into one reality television show segment, one tweet away. We're all waiting to see how Donald Trump reacts, bringing up Richard Blumenthal's, uh, you know, record of lying about being in Vietnam. And I think... I, I take it you're not being complimentary when you say that. Uh, that well, reality TV. How does the how do you keep up this momentum? How do you keep up the momentum of of every single minor criticism, which, as uh, Guy Benson reported earlier, was a minor criticism? How do you have such an intense reaction on Twitter and keep this up for the next four years? I absolutely have no idea. Well, examine that for the next four years. Now, <laughs> Joe. Um, so Trump attacked Senator Blumenthal for lying about having served in Vietnam as opposed to in the Marine Reserves. This was a half dozen years ago in a campaign. That's true, but. Blumenthal's account was confirmed to the press by a Gorsuch spokesman. That, that, Gorsuch that, that, sp spokesman. And also you had people, uh, as Megan said, Republicans saying Kelly, yeah, said yeah, sim yeah. similar yeah. things to them. And also, I mean, so now what are we supposed to do? Now we go back and we, we didn't, uh, 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 we're going to go back to Vietnam. And w was the president, what was his record in Vietnam? I mean, that started to fly back and and forth too. Uh, so do you think, bottom time. line, that this is overplayed or played about right or underplayed by the press? Well, I, the problem is the president comes out and says this stuff. Therefore, it is news. Therefore, it's news, he, and they're going to follow Can it. I jump in on that for a second? During the press briefing while this, while this was addressed, uh, there were a number of questions for six minutes over what demoralizing meant and, and how the White House was responding. There was one question in that briefing about earlier in the day, the U.S. commander in Afghanistan asked for thousands more troops to be deployed, got one question, and then it wasn't really even answered. So both sides aren't really giving the, the right amount of coverage to... to well, on the really one hand, important. it is a Supreme Court nomination at stake here. Sure. On the other hand, other, all kinds of they other things over some get overshadowed. Yeah, that's true. So uh, one of those who interviewed Blumenthal, uh, when this erupted, was uh, Chris Cuomo on a CNN morning show. And that prompted this tweet from the President of the United States. Chris Cuomo, in his interview with Senator Blumenthal, never asked him about his long-term lie about his brave, quote, service in Vietnam. Fake news. Well, Cuomo then reacted in real time, first by playing a portion of his earlier interview with Blumenthal, and then by saying this. What is your response to the President of the United States saying you should not be believed because you misrepresented your military record in the past? Really, the first point that I made in the interview, uh, the President, with all due respect, is once again off on the facts. What do you make of the way that Cuomo went back at the President? Well, you know, he was right to say he did bring this up, okay? I think in general... He brought it up and the, the Senator ducked it for the record. He didn't really answer the question. Yeah, th that's right. But look... When there is a war, there is a way for CNN to get ratings. And right now, the war is CNN versus Trump. I think other networks and other news organizations are finding ways to say, 
what he said was not accurate or the number is this, not that. And I, CNN is really taking this on in a way that inserts them into the story. Cuomo, by the way, also apologized for a later interview in which he said, for a journalist being called fake news, it's like being called the N-word. That was not a good choice of words, and I'm glad that he apologize for it. Do uh, you want to jump in on this CNN debate? Was, because it's a constant yeah. battle now between the White House and that network. I was actually going to bring up the fact that Chris Cuomo said that the term fake news is like using the N-word. I don't know exactly what he's doing, but that's obviously an egregious statement to make. Um, when you are being parodied on Saturday Night Live, as CNN is, as being a baby in a cage at a press conference with Sean Spicer, clearly there's an optic problem between CNN and the president. It seems like they are doubling down on this rivalry and this war, which I would think is ill-advised, um, but it's certainly going to be fascinating needing to watch going but forward. That's exactly what's going on. I mean, the president keeps calling them out specifically as fake news. I mean, that they are the right. arguing fake news. So they're going to keep pushing back and it just keeps escalating. So is the president getting what he wants by Probably. putting CNN on the yeah. defensive? What about it helps him with his base? Because yeah. as long as it looks like you're going after the liberal media and these fake news journalists at CNN aren't giving you the good college try as president that you should because you're a Republican, it only helps his base. What it does for independent voters is nothing, but it really rabble rouses the group of people that helped get him elected. What about the larger media debate here about Trump and the judiciary and undermining judges? And of course, the, the battle over this appellate ruling, which is not clear what the White House is going to do about that. Um, so in the Washington Post, Chris Eliza writes, major setback for his conception of a presidency with nearly unlimited power after the Ninth Circuit ruled. Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to take anything Chris Eliza says that seriously. But that being said, I love the Neil Gorsuch pick. I think he's exactly what, you know, supporters of Antonin uh, Scalia would have wanted. And he's the rightful heir. Yeah, but but I, I want you to respond to Scalia's okay. major, major setback because of the Ninth Circuit ruling against. Is it a major setback? Because it's an argument about a temporary restraining order. I don't think it's a major setback. But that being said, what we discussed earlier on the show, I think he should quit tweeting in sort of the impulsive way that he is because all the political capital that you got by making this great choice for sort of goes out the window with these tweets well, that's what he said uh, Chris Liz is saying this helps Trump with his base I mean that, that some establishment figures in Washington are, are you know are saying that it's a big setback are you kidding me he he's trying to do his ban whether you want to call it a ban or not the courts are stopping him he goes after the so-called judges the elites in Washington yeah. uh -huh. Hair goes on fire. Spoken as a, and he's go in his base. Spoken, uh, spoken as a true political consultant. I want to move on to this other issue involving Michael Flynn. Very controversial story now after the Washington Post quoted nine unnamed officials, senior officials, are saying that the National Security Advisor had discussed before Trump took office the question of U.S. sanctions with the Russian ambassador, uh, which the sources, according to this story in the Post, view as inappropriate and potentially illegal. Let me play for you how some television anchors are treating uh, this leaked story. If this is proven uh, that he that he did this, do you think he should be disciplined in any way? Should he leave the, the White House? How do you read what's happening here with Mike Flynn? Is it a is it a, a large enough deal that he should be asked by the president to step aside? This is how a media drumbeat starts, where then every segment is tagged with or has a question about should he resign? Could he resign? Why won't he resign? Is, is that what journalists should be well, doing? If you ask a leading question, you're going to get a defensive answer. The question should be, what is the administration doing about this? What should the repercussions be? What should standards be going forward? And then you might get a little bit more in that interview. It only harms the interviewer by asking those leading questions. Now, Megan, this is a serious story and a serious question. Um, but the coordinated leak here, because so many different sources, suggests that there are people in this administration who would like perhaps to push Michael Flynn out. And of course, what they're also trying to do is hurt President Trump. Yeah, I mean, the White House has a leak problem from the top down starting for the last three weeks. This particular story, if you care at all about Russia and the administration's relationship with Vladimir Putin, this is an extremely serious story. There's allegations that he took money and that you made a phone call on Christmas Day and then lied to our vice president. These are very intense allegations. But if you make this partisan and this about they should step down, uh, you know, this this administration is, you know, is behaving in the wrong way and you make this a Democrat versus Republican issue instead of about national security, that's where the media gets it wrong. So you think the media are making it excessively partisan? I, I, I Potentially. Think, I think when you, it looks like you are, I, go ahead. I just think this is a drip, drip, drip in which Flynn himself is sort of adding to the fire by suddenly 
can't recall, doesn't remember, maybe I did say Well, initially, just to get it straight, initially uh, Flynn told the Washington Post that that conversation never happened, they didn't discuss it. Then the next day uh, he said that uh, he doesn't recall it, as you say, Joe, uh, but he doesn't think it came up. And, of course, Vice President Pence defended him on national television, on Fox News Sunday, in fact, uh, and elsewhere, right, um, because, based on Flynn's assur uh, assurances. Right, so what I'm saying is it, 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 the way they've handled it, the way Flynn's handled this in terms of walking things back, I think, is just flaming more questions, and you're going to have, look, there are partisans inside the White House who want to get rid of them. There are partisans outside. They're going to take advantage of this and flame the media. And these, I think you're right, these leading questions. You also uh, had... That, just sort of putting more pressure on him. You also had a leak to Reuters about how uh, when President Trump was talking to Vladimir Putin and the New Star Treaty came up, he asked an aide, well, what is that? And the White House disputes that. But so many leaks from within the building or other buildings like the State Department. They definitely have a leaking problem right now, which if I were working in the White House, I would be doing as much as possible to find out exactly whom it's coming from and why. All of that being said, this story is legitimate. My concern is everything having to do with Russia is spun by the White House and by President Trump as being, you know, sort of part of the DNC conspiracy theory. And there are legitimate questions that people want answered. Absolutely legitimate story. The way it was being covered is something that we examine here. You can let us know what you think about the media. Media buzz at foxnews.com. Ahead, Sarah Huckabee Sanders responds on behalf of the White House. But when we come back, a major media pushback against the president's charge of inadequate coverage of terror attacks. Does he have a point? There's been a media revolt against President Trump over his charge that news organizations aren't covering many terror attacks or aren't covering them enough. And that quote, as you saw earlier, they have their reasons. Megan McCain, yeah. the network says we saw a pushback pretty hard on this. Um, Trump says they're not covering it for a reason. What do you make of this back and forth? Yeah, I didn't understand this at all. And you need more evidence than just simply uh, sending out a list of terror attacks that, in my opinion, were covered very well, especially extensively on this network. I also find it strange that your spokesperson, Kellyanne Conway, is going on TV and making up massacres at the same time she well, took that a lot was a of mistake that. for which she it was apologized. a mistake but it's still uh, it's still being used in memes and protest signs all over the country sorry continue I <laughs> think you keep cutting her off she's yeah, cut cutting you off. me off I, I think many I'm going to cut you off now I think many journalists are personally offended by this I'm going to give you a lot of time Joe because they've gotten on planes to cover the aftermath of some of these well things. yeah they they but that offense is working for, work for uh, Trump again and, and I, I watched the news that day. They, they pushed back so hard. Let us show you all the times we right. covered. And how does that help uh, him? I'm sitting there at home going like, man, that's a lot of attacks. I mean, in other words, it, it actually kind of, he's a win-win. If they all back off and say, yeah, you're right, we didn't, he wins. Uh, and if it, they come back and show a lot of the coverage that they did, they, he's, they're there making his point. There was a kernel of a concept that was worthy of more discussion that maybe we don't cover foreign policy and national security enough. Now, was he wrong in what he said? Yes. Did media organizations pu push back as they should have? Yes, but maybe we could have discussed it a little bit further. You recall in 2014, there were tons of ISIS beheadings, and, and then there was a discussion after that that maybe we shouldn't give ISIS that much publicity. But that's exactly the point I was going to bring up, Megan. The, the, the debate in media circles before this has been whether we give these attacks too much coverage, whether we're, the, the press is playing into the terrorist hands by making it the lead story for days and days. Uh, I don't, it's a hard dilemma to resolve, and here's uh, the president saying, they're not covering some of these attacks adequately, and they have their reasons. What do you think he was insinuating? Well, the, the implication is that there are political reasons why the Obama administration somehow wasn't letting you know about terror attacks. Well, but there's a thing called social media and yeah. the Internet. Yes, and played it down. I, I, what Again, if we're like taking reality and taking it a few steps further, I, I would assume that means just because the Obama administration was saying everything's going amazing in Iraq and Afghanistan, ISIS has not metastasized, it hasn't grown, and he was trying to say they were covering in that way. All of this is really clumsy narrative. I mean, you know this very well. I just wish they could keep this concise and tight instead of trying to, you know, read the tea leaves of exactly the kernel of truth, as you said, but, they're trying to say. But I agree with Aaron. There was a missed opportunity to actually have a discussion about how we cover this. And uh, instead, it was just sort of defensive and going right back on the attack against well, something the president. The White House said. list of 78 attacks included some that there were no casualties and some that we hadn't heard of because they were, you know, look, we obviously cover attacks far more intensively when they're uh, 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 on foreign soil and they're not in a place like Britain or France. Uh, but they also included Orlando, San Bernardino. 
Paris, Nice, which got saturation coverage. Oh, that I mean, uh, there are a lot of people who would argue, and I'd be one of them, that on some of them, we just covered them so much and put so much fear out there. Uh, and that's the argument, I think, that we, you know, when we just were if I can inject one last said, note here in the time we have left. So President Trump also this week talked about how the murder rate in our country is the highest it's been in 47 years. Actually, it's near a half century low. The next day he used a different statistic about the increase, which was accurate. Um, so there seems to be a constant. And we, we talked about this a little bit with CNN. Well, president was wrong about this. President was wrong about that. CBS's Scott Pelley says divorced from reality in the lead of his newscast. Look, they do need to get their facts straight. And, and President Trump should make that a goal of his for the year 2017 to start putting out accurate statistics. I do think back on the terrorism thing, though, I would like to ask him, what is it that you think the American public is missing? Not just what is the media not covering? What do you want to tell us about terrorism that you've learned since taking office? Uh, well, you're at the White House every day now. You can you can ask that question. Aaron McPike, we'll see you later. Megan McCain, Joe Trippi, thanks for stopping by this Sunday ahead. How the media are treating Elizabeth Warren as opposed to, say, Sean Spicer. But up next, a media furor over the president whacking Nordstrom for dropping his daughter's clothing line. Trish Regan is on deck. When Nordstrom announced it was dropping Ivanka Trump's clothing line, the company touched off a major controversy and a presidential response on Twitter. Quote, my daughter Ivanka has been treated so unfairly by at Nordstrom. She's a great person, always pushing me to do the right thing. Terrible. And then there's another one in which uh, the president says Ivanka is being abused and treated so badly by the media. I spoke about the coverage with Trish Regan, who hosts the Intel Report on Fox Business weekdays at 2 Eastern. Trish Regan, welcome. Hi, Howie. So Nordstrom says Ivanka Trump's clothing line just isn't selling that well, so we decided to drop it two weeks into the administration. Are you buying that? Not entirely, no. I think that there's a, a lot of politics at play here, and we're seeing it over and over again, increasingly so in businesses, and it's a little disturbing, Howie. I think what really was going on here is that Nordstrom's didn't like getting the uh, shock effect of all the people that don't like Trump going after them on Twitter, and so this is their response. This is how they're dealing with right, it. Right, right. So let me ask you, you know, the president, as everyone now knows, decides to put up a tweet criticizing Nordstrom's decision on the grounds. Mm -hmm. And, and the press just really pounces on this on the grounds that he's trying to help his daughter's business. Your take? I think, let's not forget, this, this man is a father and his daughter's been slighted. And you've got daughters, I've got daughters. I mean, as a parent, part of what you would always do is stick up for your child. So I think that there's a, a whole lot more at play here. And this is in part just a dad being a dad. Right. But the you argument know, is it's, it's not just a dad being a dad because he's the president of the United States and uh, he is targeting a specific corporation. That's the mm -hmm. argument, at least, that I see in a lot of the stories. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and people have gone after him for targeting a lot of different corporations for, uh, you know, for example, going after the F-35 program saying we need to change this and we need to, you know, he, he has done that. Um, and, and he's got certainly a bully pulpit, if you would, that makes it a little nerve wracking for businesses. And I guess Nordstrom now is uh, seeing his wrath. And I hear you. There's some criticism that perhaps he shouldn't have done this. But I think uh, this may have been just somewhat of an emotional response. And when someone goes after after your child, Howie, you go back at him, even if you're the president of the United States. I can understand that part. Now, Kellyanne Conway, as you know, got in a bit of hot water when she went on Fox and Friends and said this. Go buy Ivanka's stuff is what I would say. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get. I hate shopping. I'm gonna go get some on myself today. I'm gonna give a free okay. commercial here. Go buy it today, everybody. You can <laughs> right. find it online. Sean Spicer later said that Kellyanne Conway had been counseled. Did she make a mistake? I think that Kellyanne, if she could, would take back those comments. Uh, you know, I, I think that she perhaps spoke too hastily there, uh, and she absolutely would take back those comments. But all these concerns about ethics right now, I mean, the one thing I'd tell you, Howie, is at least it's all out in the open, right? At least we all know about it. With Donald Trump, what you see is what you get, and you know that this stuff is going on. So I think the real danger perhaps Howie in Washington, happens to be those backroom deals that you don't hear about. That's what we need to be concerned about. But on this, this point, one, on this she, point. Uh, she probably would take it back, but it's, it's not like it's going to make or break anything. Right. On this point about the, all the concerns about ethics, is there a media mindset that the, the main thing that Donald Trump wants to do is somehow, beyond sort of running the world, is to enrich himself and enrich his family by doing things that will help the family business? 
There absolutely is that mindset. Here's the reality, Howie. He's the president of the United States. Anybody who is president of the United States will just by being the president enrich themselves. In other words, the value of all of his holdings, all of his real estate, I'm sorry, he's president. It just went up. And that's the reality, and the media just needs to get over it. He's already got a fair amount of money. Uh, Trish again, great to see you. Thanks very much for joining Good us. Good to see you, Howie. You bet. Ahead on Media Buzz is the press lionizing Elizabeth Warren after Senate Republicans shut her down on the floor. But first, Sarah Huckabee Sanders is here with the White House view of all these negative stories swirling around the president. Time now to get the White House view of this flood of negative stories. And joining us here in the studio, Sarah Huckabee Sanders, Deputy Communications Director for President Trump. Sarah, welcome. Thank you. Just a few days, you've had stories on uh, President Trump losing the court case in the Ninth Circuit. You have had stories about unflattering stories about the president's call with Vladimir Putin, uh, President Trump and Kellyanne Conway defending Ivanka on the Nordstrom matter. It's not that these aren't legitimate stories, but do you feel at all that you can't even buy a positive headline? Look, I think some of the uh, stories may have a little bit of legitimacy, but as a whole, I really don't think they do. But I think what it tells you is that the more that President Trump's uh, opponents go negative, he's probably doing something right. He's had probably 21 of the most successful days that any uh, first term president has had. Look at all he has accomplished. Look how aggressive he has been. He campaigned on change and turning Washington upside down. And nobody can argue that the first 21 days have not been exactly what he promised on the campaign well, trail. Well, I'm sure you're not arguing that the uh, battle, the court battle uh, over the temporary travel ban is not a legitimate story. But let me move on to this. We have media, major media organizations pushing back. We played this earlier against the president for saying that the press as a whole is either downplaying or not adequately covering many terror attacks. And he went on to say they have their reasons. What did he mean? Look, I think the big point here is look at the number of attacks that we've had. I think he's just trying to demonstrate uh, the seriousness of what is taking place in our country and around the world right now, and that we cannot allow people to come into our country. And he's trying to prove a point of why this uh, travel executive order is so important. He's looking out for the safety of our but country. Sir, when he says, what did they mean? He appears to be insinuating that there's some sort of political agenda reason that the press, in his view, isn't giving enough coverage to many terror attacks. Is look, that the president's meaning? Look, I, again, I go back. The meaning is real clear and it's real simple. Any terrorist attack, even one, is too many. And we have to do everything that we can to ensure that that doesn't happen again. Does That's that include a lot of coverage? Does that help make the case? Well, I think making uh, those things known, look, here's a problem. When we're covering the death of Prince more than we're covering terrorist attacks, that's a problem. That is a big discrepancy. And I think that that was the point he was trying to All make. Right. Again, it's not that we need to do wall-to-wall -wall coverage, but we need to do wall-to-wall -wall protection. And that's what this president is trying to do. He's trying to do everything he can to protect our borders, protect our country, and fulfill the number one job of the president, which is keeping Americans safe. All right, so White House official Stephen Miller was on all the Sunday shows today, except for CNN, State of the Union, and one uh, White House official who did, the same thing with Pence last week, by the way, with Vice President Pence, one official who did go on Jake Tapper's uh, weekday show uh, is Kellyanne Conway. Let's take a look at that. It is very difficult to hear those criticisms from a White House that has such little regard day in, day out for facts, for truth. Are we White fake House. news, Kellyanne? Is CNN fake news? No, I don't think CNN is fake news. I think there are some reports everywhere in print, on TV, on radio, in conversation that are not well researched and are and are sometimes based on falsehoods. So is the White House essentially boycotting CNN, at least on Sunday mornings, by not making top officials available? <laughs> not at all. And I, I, I'd like to clear up, I, there was an offer for someone to go on last week, and they didn't take us up on it. Well, this week, Jake Tapper says the White House just simply didn't get back to him. Well, I, I'm, I'm not sure about what happened this week. Uh, I'm happy to go on Jake's show anytime. But I think that the bigger question is, when are they going to start to show, particularly Jake, I watched that interview, um, it just... I'm trying to think of a diplomatic way to say it, but he just wasn't, a, it wasn't journalism. And until they want to start asking real questions and talking about real stories that Americans care about, instead of getting in the back and forth well, and the- well, I have to jump in here. Why, why wasn't it journalism? That's a pretty serious charge. Well, I mean, I'm not saying the entire interview, but there were parts of it like, 
the accusations of boycotting their network and things like that when we've clearly offered for people to be on, I think that's a, that's a big deal and that's a serious charge for them. Let's talk about your colleague, Sean Spicer, for a second. There's been a lot of media chatter about his job, not just because Melissa McCarthy played him again last night on SNL, but the Washingtonian Magazine reported that the former Navy SEAL Carl Higby, quote, according to the article, has been interviewed for the position of White House Press Secretary, according to two senior administration officials. And I'm just bringing this up to give you a chance to respond, because I understand you were involved in that. Yeah, I think it's probably one of the most ridiculous stories out there uh, right now. And frankly, one of the reasons that um, I find this story to be so absurd is because one of the closing lines of the story was that they reached out to the White House for comment and we didn't respond when I was the one that actually talked to that reporter an hour before her story posted and told her how uh, untrue every part of that story was. Carl Higby's never even been to the White House, much less interviewed for a position. And the fact that she went ahead and published the story and also uh, failed to mention that she had talked to me uh, is mind-boggling. And I think a perfect example of why we are so frustrated with the amount of fake news out there and that reporters are not letting the facts get in the way of those fake news stories. Well, Higby later backed off and said he hadn't had any formal interviews in his phrase. But all of these leaks, this particular leak story, which is essentially about White House infighting, and the Washington Post story about Michael Flynn, serious subject, conversations he had with the Russian ambassador before the inauguration, and about the president's conversations with world leaders, unflattering versions to put out. How concerned is the president about this flood of leaks, uh, all of which, or many of which, I would say, seem aimed at undermining him? Look, I think the number one concern the president has right now is creating jobs, protecting Americans, building a wall, making education better. He's focused on doing exactly what he spent the last year and a half talking about, not uh, talking about the stories that the media wants to play up. Because when he's traveling around the country,